Because of what you said, where a lot of doctors still aren't seeing this as a, a need to get tested for, vitamin D deficiently is, deficiency rather, is probably still misdiagnosed as a, a number of other things. Is that correct? Yes, it probably is overlooked uh, in a number of different diseases. Um, chronic pain, uh, something that's rising significantly in, in, in the United States uh, right now. Um, uh, there was a study that was done uh, looking at chronic pain, and they found that patients who had low vitamin D levels, below normal, um, were using twice as much pain medication um, as the patients in the pain clinic who had normal vitamin D levels. And so there's a correlation there with how much pain you experience among patients with chronic pain. Mm -hmm. Another example of a uh, disorder that uh, um, is, is sometimes misdiagnosed uh, 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 and is vitamin D deficiency is fibromyalgia, which is one of these chronic pain disorders. Um, uh, now, I would say that the challenging thing is that because vitamin D is so prevalent, it's, it, it, it can sometimes be difficult to tease out cause from effect, okay? Um, uh, and someone who is miserably ill is going to get even less sun exposure, mm -hmm. are going to be eating the wrong foods, is going to be less physically active. Um, uh, and so you don't want, I, I'm not saying that everybody with fibromyalgia has vitamin D deficiency, but probably 70% do because 70% of the population is deficient. Sure. And within those groups, and I have examples in the book of that, and, and I'm sure other practitioners have similar, um, have had similar experiences, is that there are occasional patients with fibromyalgia where that is the primary driver of their pain and fatigue and, mm -hmm. and misery. And when you correct that, they get dramatically better. Um, and you, you certainly don't want to miss those patients where, where vitamin D, a simple inexpensive solution, uh, uh, is the primary driver of their symptom mm. complex. Could, could a person be deficient and not really know it? And, and is, there any, is there harm in that? Um, in fact, most patients who have vitamin D deficiency don't know it. Um, uh, and they either don't know it because they don't know what symptoms mm -hmm. are associated with deficiency or they don't know it because they just feel fine and they've never been measured. Um, and uh, this is human nature that if I feel fine, there's nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. But we know that if you feel fine, you could still have a cholesterol of 400, a blood pressure of 200 over 120, um, uh, and a whole host of other things going on, and you won't know until something really bad happens, mm -hmm. okay? So, um, so symptoms, unfortunately, are often a f fairly late sign in any disease process or deficiency or imbalance, okay? Um, uh, and so, uh, so just because you don't have any symptoms doesn't mean that you're not at risk. Take the risk quiz, okay, um, uh, online. Um, uh, or get tested and find out um, because it's a simple test, it's, it's relatively inexpensive, and there's something, some immediate things you can do to, to change your risk. So like any other disease, like you mentioned, cholesterol, high blood pressure, good to get a check to stay on top of it because once you get too far down the road, it takes a lot longer to get where you want to be more optimal health. Right. right? Well, the longer you're deficient in something, the more likely um, uh, pathology, biological abnormalities mm -hmm. have occurred as a consequence. Here's an example. There's, the, recently, the in, Institute of Medicine came out with recommendations on vitamin D. Um, uh, and uh, I, I wrote a blog that talked about how they sort of missed the mark, which most of the people in the vitamin D field uh, feel they've missed the mark. Um, but they, they've moved in the right direction. They're just moving at a snail's pace. So they increased the recommended D amounts, and they decreased their recommended calcium intakes. But they just need to do that a lot a lot more. Um, <clears throat> there was a paper uh, um, uh, I, I found that actually only came out about a year and a half ago, which really sort of definitively tells us what the cut point is for normal vitamin D levels. And it was a study, an autopsy study, sounded mm. gruesome, <laughs> autopsy study done in Germany <clears throat> um, because it, they were going to use bone biopsies as the test, and okay. it's hard to get people to volunteer for bone biopsies. So um, they said, well, what we want to do is take people who died um, from trauma, um, but not from chronic illness, um, uh, and we're going to biopsy their bone, and we're going to look for changes, uh, which is really a balance of mineralized versus unmineralized bone. Um, and there's, there's a certain ratio 
that's normal. And when you get outside that ratio, it suggests there's a mineralization defect, meaning calcium is not getting put into the bone normally. Um, and the most common cause of that is vitamin D deficiency. Okay. So they thought this would be a great way to find out over a group of people um, at the tissue level, not just a blood test level, but actually tissue level, mm -hmm. um, uh, where's this threshold for vitamin D deficiency? And, and since they had blood from these, these former people, um, uh, they could measure the D level, do the bone biopsy, and, and, and correlate the two. And what they found was that as long as your vitamin D level was greater than 30, you had a normal ratio of unmineralized to mineralized bone. Hmm. And when you fell below 30, that's when you started seeing. It wasn't universal, meaning everybody who had a level below mm -hmm. 30 had abnormal mineralization of their bone, but all of the cases of abnormal mineralization fell below that threshold. That's pretty definitive yeah. to me that there is a threshold there and that we need to have a level above 30. Well, the Institute of Medicine said, oh, no, anything above, anything above 20 or 25 is fine. Even with that study out. Even with yeah. that study out. So, um, uh, and, and, and after the recommendations came out, I called up several of the other um, uh, sort of researchers on vitamin D, Reinhold uh, Vieth, I sent him an email. I said, so what gives, Reinhold? Uh, uh, did they not read this, this data? He says, oh, they read it, and it's in their report. They just completely misinterpreted the study. Um, and uh, so, you know, the Institute of Medicine, unfortunately, there's these researchers who have been doing research on vitamin D for 30, 40 years. Um, and the Institute of Medicine considers them tainted, biased. And so instead, they got a whole bunch of researchers who don't do research on vitamin D to analyze the data and decide what the recommended amounts should be. That would be like hiring non-astrophysicists to work on our space program and non-rocket scientists. Well, they're biased. So instead of hiring rocket scientists and physicists to run NASA, we're going to hire um, uh, home builders and, um, uh, you know, plumbers. What? Why aren't you hiring the people who have been doing the research for the last 40 mm -hmm. years? It, it makes no sense to me. But this is the logic that, they're, that they use, um, and I, I really can't explain the logic, but um, it, ex it does explain their recommendations being off the mark as far as um, what the people who've been doing research for 30 and 40 years are, are saying about vitamin D. So really this should be part of our protocol when we check our blood pressure and check our cholesterol, that should be Yeah, right I up honestly there. think for the amount that it costs, uh, um, which is, um, I wanna say a vitamin D test costs 50, 70, 80 bucks. Mm -hmm. That's cheaper than a lipid profile. Cholesterol profiles, 200 bucks sometimes, mm -hmm. okay? So, and you don't have to measure it all the time. So you measure it peak and trough, end of summer, end of winter, mm -hmm. find out what their highs and lows are, or replace them and then measure at peak and trough to see that uh, they're where you want them to be at mm -hmm. peak and trough. And as long as they don't lose a tremendous amount of weight and their lifestyle doesn't change dramatically, you may not need to measure it ever again. They just need to stay on the amount of supplement sure. that keeps them in the middle. And so it's not something unlike the cholesterol where you're constantly monitoring it because there's a very simple way to replace this and normalize it, unlike cholesterol where you're on meds and it's sometimes, they sometimes work and they sometimes don't work and they have all kinds of side effects and toxicity. This is very simple. You, f you make the diagnosis, you calculate the dose. We actually have tables in the book that tell you how to very precisely calculate um, vitamin D replacement. And, um, and then you remeasure two or three months later and see if you're on target. And then you might check a, a peak or a trough to see that they're on target at the extremes of the year and then you're done. And so maybe you measure it two, three, four, five, six times tops, and uh, you may never have to measure it again. Mm. So how is this uh, an expensive proposition? Um, uh, it, it seems to me to be very, very simple.